Welcome to the very first Camber Talk podcast, where we talk photos with photographers and people associated with the photography world. My first guest on this podcast is photographer John Angerson. Welcome, John. Good morning, Zach. Hi, John. What we're going to do today is just going to delve into your life as a photographer, as a person. What, where did it all start? How did it all happen? What, where did you grow up? John, you've, you've had over 22 exhibitions of your work. Your clients have included a range of editorial clients, corporate clients. You've worked for charities. You're now mentoring. You're a lecturer. You've published three books, am I right, thinking that? Uh, three, yeah. Uh, maybe one more, actually, but that was a long time, before, long, long ago. I'm aware you're working on a, a new book project now. What? Just give us a quick insight to that. Tell us what you're doing now. What are you up to work-wise and this book project you're working on? It's a long way off, if I'm honest, because um, I haven't quite worked out exactly what, I'm, what the actual project is. <laughs> I know it's something to do with our relationship with grass. That sounds a bit flaky, because at the moment it is a bit flaky. Um, but it's all to do with um, me trying to access famous bits of English grass um, and sort of use that as a metaphor for various other things. Because I think grass is very, particularly, in, uh, I've got a slight obsession with Englishness and our, I, I guess that's identity, isn't it? My identity. Um, so yeah, it's it started. I've got lots in the pipeline. Not much has happened during the winter because obviously grass doesn't grow. Um, uh, so I've, I've got quite a few set up for April. Um, so yeah, it's a long way off though. I, it's at least a couple of years off, I think. Um, how are you shooting it? Are you, how are you shooting it? At the moment I'm shooting it all on my 5.4. Um, and I've been researching archive stuff. I've spent a bit of time at the, um, rural museum here in near where I live in, in Reading. Uh, I've written to the queen. I tried to get access to the grass of Buckingham Palace. Uh, she said no, um, but I got a quite nice letter back from her. Um, and I've also been tracking down vintage uh, advertising for grass um, paraphernalia, um, like grass seeds. I've been in contact with a collector based in Finland who collects um, old advertising hoardings and um, interesting painting uh, you know sort of like that old sort of 1960s um design um what else have i been doing oh yeah and i've started growing various different types of grass in my greenhouse although i've realized that grass doesn't like greenhouses so again i can't do much till april um because i had a long conversation with a grass grower i'm going to gr a grass laboratory in april as well where they they develop grass for football pitches and tennis courts and what have you and I had a long chat with him and he said greenhouses aren't the way to go you ha they have to have air and light so a greenhouse isn't ideal because it hasn't got a throughput of air so it's a big learning curve on how to grow grass I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the grass when I've grown it but I've got lots of different seeds that I've found I've sourced very odd like almost extinct types of grass so you can see I have no idea what I'm doing with it what I tend to do is make a huge pile of ideas um, some work, some don't work, some are dead ends, some turn into something else. And then sometimes the project might just get, might just get shelved. Uh, a lot of projects that, have started. That's part of the process. Yeah, that's, it? yeah, yeah. And it might, it might metamorphosize into something completely different. It might have nothing to do with grass, but grass is the, is the, um, the sort of foundation of the idea. If that makes sense, and then from that I build. Yeah. I'm digging my a, foundations, basically. I'm do you have a working foundations. title for the project? No, not yet. Uh, did I? No. Interestingly, grass is the first. There's lots of interesting things about. I've read lots of books on grass. The first mention of any plant in the Holy Bible is grass. Uh, in Genesis, it's like in the f sort of chapter seven. I mean, verse seven, chapter one. It mentions grass. It mentions grass seed, actually. Um, so, and there's, uh, William Blake, you know, the, the sort of the English poet come visionary, he talks and has a really interesting relationship. Lots of his poetry and lots of his paintings incorporate grass. So I've been researching about, and I've got a meeting with an academic, uh, um, 
a William Blake academic in a couple of weeks who's I'm going to pick his brains about William Blake's relationship with grass again England grass um painting who knows if they're all it's all just a load of jumble at the moment imagine a jumble cell and you've got yeah sorry a lot of your later work which which you've really delved into um, literature and you're trying to visualize literature which you're saying you do now with the grass and you did that priestly uh, late earlier on you 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 it's just an important part of your your journey as a photographer I think if I I think the inherent problem with documentary photography is it has a habit of repeating itself and it has a habit of um, visually repeating itself and um, content wise just you know you see pictures that you it's like one big sort of circle of imagery and ideas so I've been really yeah. conscious to sort of mix it up a little bit and try re, not reinvent it it's to sort of play around with it a little bit and see where it might go and yeah. add add extra elements extra layers of ideas and extra layers of layers of visuals and you know artifacts and archive and you know who, who know you know wh it's whatever inter whatever interests me i try and layer it on top it, or layer yeah, it in it's an interesting link as well. So your current project is about the English obsession with grass, and now it's becoming your obsession with grass. Am I right? I think? think that's. I think if I'm honest, it all stemmed from an English journey picture I did yeah. of the um, the turf at Anfield in Liverpool, at Liverpool Football Club, and that picture somehow keeps. Whenever I see it, I always think there's something interesting going on there. The fact it's just a piece of grass and it says so much without you know without it being too clever i'm quite i'm quite interested in the interested in the fact that um pictures don't necessarily have to shout at you they don't have to and if you spend a bit of time with particularly for example english journey i'm pretty sure a lot of people that have seen that work kind of go what what this isn't there's it doesn't it doesn't um instantly gratify visually yeah but a lot of people who've spent a bit of time with it kind of understand where i'm coming from and kind of get the vibe and get the uh, get the the con concept horrible word but you know what i mean yeah. get the and then they suddenly hook into where i'm going with it yeah. uh and i found it's just, it's a slow it's it's a slow burn you know, it's a slow burn way of doing things. They're not in, they're not epic sort of traditional uh, documentary photographs that we've all seen and love. They're a kind of my version of it, if that makes sense. It makes you kind of quietly think about what is going on here. Well, what would you say is a traditional? It's, of, it's, of, it's, it's, it's often in black and white. It's, yeah. o, it's often, you know, it's often of people it's often fairly close up it's often sort of wide you know wide in inverted commas wide as in you see a lot of information yeah and quite quite often it's of something that isn't necessarily positive yeah that said not not every you know but do you know what i mean I, i've just after i i think you mentioned it earlier i did a book on a, a religious cult at the very beginning of my career and it was black it was all those things i mentioned it was black and white it, i spent years hang you know embedding myself with the community yeah. and after i'd finished that book and that project i kind of had a sort of wake up call and thought i've got to not do this again i found myself going down that road again thinking oh i'll do another one of something else you know i'll shoot it you know in that sort of traditional sense traditional approach and you know that traditional uh journey of making work and i thought no i can't do that because it will just look the same and it won't challenge me i will i'll be in my i'll continue being in my comfort zone yeah so if i've got to abandon all known methods yeah. and and it, it at the time when i went from that end of that project into the english journey project it must have been at least four or five years where i didn't actually show any work i made tons of mistakes I hadn't got a clue how to use a 5.4 camera. 
you know, I hadn't got a clue what I was doing really, because it was like a whole new journey. But over time and lots of, you know, the English journey, I'm not sure if anyone knows, I actually did it. I was meant to do it in one go. I ended up doing it like three times. Because the first time round, it, it was just really boring. The second time round, technically it was poor. And the third time round, I kind of worked out what I was doing. To be fair, some of the images I took on the first go and the second go kind of made it into the final book. Yeah. But the third time round, I'd basically, I'd basically worked out how I was going to do it. And I felt confident in what I was doing. Yeah. And so this next project I'm working on now, I'm trying to abandon all the things I've learned from the second one. But isn't that what it's all about? It's a yeah. journey. Yeah. As a business, you are a business. You know, you're a photographer, but you're a business. And all businesses and all artistic crafts, they have to evolve. They have to take different routes. They have to have a, a journey. And, 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 you know, you, you say that in a lot of your work. You know, you change your format, your style. But before that, can we go back to the beginning? Can we go back to how John Agerson became a photographer? And then we'll pick up on your journey in the 90s from where it all sort of came together. So mm. go back, go back to the beginning. Tell us about how you started life and where, right, you, I was, where you came from. I was born in Bristol. In um, Got a brother and a sister. And uh, my dad was, my mum was a teacher. And my father was, um, he worked setting up um, common ownership companies, companies that were run by the workers. Uh, and um, he sort of went all over the world sort of helping people create common ownership companies. And then we left there um, when I was about five and we moved to the beautiful town of Northampton. Um, my dad, was, I wouldn't say he was a photographer, but he had always had a Super 8 camera and he always had cameras about. You know, he had a sort of like Rolliflex copy and he had a, he had like a little Rolly 35 mil. Uh, and he, I think he started getting annoyed with me asking to use it. So I remember yeah. one day he saw an advert in our local paper for like for sale, a camera. And by pure chance, I remember going with my dad to this man's house, knocking on his door. And it transpired this guy was a retired portrait photographer, a quite well-known Northamptonian uh, who had a little photography business and he was selling all his cameras. He was in his 80s. And I think he saw that I had a... I was so interested in the whole thing and I was asking all these questions. And he said, um, I think the camera was like £20 or something, £25. Uh, and he said, here's a roll of film. Go and shoot some pictures um, this is how you use the camera and then come back and I'll sh and I'll process it for you. He had a dark room in his in his back, you know, at the bottom of his garden. So I rode my bike, you know, I shot some pictures of my brother and sister, you know, mucking around in the garden. And I went back to this guy's house, dropped off the film. Um, and then he said, oh, we'll come back in a few days and I'll show you the negatives. And then he showed me the negatives and he goes, this one really worked. This one, you didn't close down the aperture blah 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 he says come into the dark room we'll print one and that was it that was it i went into this guy's dark room it was red light and this old boy got you know got his sort of like agfa record rapid paper out yeah and did this massive print and i just thought wow this is this is something else and i was 14 i think 14 13 wow. 14 that was it next birthday i went and bought myself chemicals um and some photographic paper and started doing photograms in my cupboard. Um, and then uh, I will, obviously uh, I was at school at this point. I think I'd gone to, you know, upper school and my art teacher was really, you know, I took, I took my camera in a few times to school. Um, and then one afternoon, um, a Sea King helicopter, bizarre, I don't know why, come to our school to I don't know just demonstrate probably to make people join the army um, uh, and it landed on our playing field and I remember taking a photograph of it outside the, the from the art room window and it had in the idea into my head thought I reckon the local paper might be interested in this so after school I persuaded my mum to let me ride the bike into town went to the local newspaper 
went to reception and I said, oh, um, I've got a photograph I think you might want. Next thing I know, the, the sort of picture editor came down, a guy called um, Keith Price, he was called. And he says, come up, lad, come up. And then I walked into the dark room and then some dark room guy took the film off me. Uh, I remember them sort of printing it wet, um, whacked it in the larger. The picture came out and he goes, You've, you just sold yourself a picture there, son. Uh, and he, I think he paid me like 20, something like 24 quid for this. Wow. And it was used on page five, you know, helicopter, seeking helicopter comes to Northampton school for boys, you know. And I, and I thought, hold on a sec. I've just made 20, you know, you can imagine when you're 13, 14, 15, making 24 quid. It's like, you know, I made the big time. Then it suddenly, and then I, every time I heard of something interesting, I'd go off from the camera, go back to the Chronicle Echo, and they would either pay me, well, they, they used to pay me and give me film and paper as well. Every time I went, they'd give me a a box of like 50 HP 5s. You know, the big square boxes you used to get. Yeah, but that was the practice then. Yeah. When you, you went to do a shoot for an editorial client, you would get the film. Yeah, they used to sort of like, you know, it was like, I, I think people forget that there was no digital. So yeah. film was almost like, um, salt or sugar you know it was like yeah. a commodity it was just here you go here's some film and they'd give you 50 roll, 50 rolls of tri-x or whatever yeah so, it's in it's interesting when you realize how you can make money and that you can make money by doing something you're becoming passionate about it's an i remember that first feeling with me and i'm thinking wow i've just made some money from this yeah and then the, the mechanisms start going in your head and then that's when the journey really starts, doesn't it? It's like, yeah. I can do something with this. I can see this as, a, as, a, as an income. Were you at that time aware of the outside world? Because what year was this? What year was this roughly? This would have been 1987, 1988. So maybe a bit. There was a, yeah, maybe 87. At, at that time, there was a really big English photography scene, wasn't there? Mm. Were you aware of well, what was going no, on in the outside not world? Really, I remember finding a Bill Brandt book in the in the school library, and thinking, "Oh, I see. People actually do take pictures and make books and publish stuff." And then I think I, I think I saw Don McCullum work in the Sunday Times magazine. Um, you know, I, I remember seeing stuff in. I remember just seeing the Sunday Times magazine thinking, oh, I see, they take pictures and they get, oh, wow. You know, it was, it was all quite naive. I didn't, you know, I didn't put, but when I left school, I sort of flunked everything, more or less. Yeah. And then I did, there was no photography courses in those days. Well, there was, but um, there was very few photography courses. There was, you know, dotted around England. So I ended up doing a graphic design course at Northampton School of Art. And there I started seeing, we had, my photography tutor had this guy, one of his friends put an exhibition up in our corridor of our, of our, you know, of our college. It was a guy called Tom Wood and he'd done an exhibition called Looking for Love. Yeah. And I remember, I'm getting a cold thing down my back now. I remember walking through the corridor, seeing these big colour prints thinking, oh my God, I was transported into this world of Liverpool nightclubs and the colour and the, the sweat and I just thought this is it I found it I found what you know I just wow. it was like that was it and then my tutor at college sort of kind of guided me a bit he was more he was more of a kind of fashion photographer yeah I don't think he was that into what I was doing but at this point I'd um I'd been in I'd been to the local record shop actually and outside the local record shop was this group of um they were called the jesus army they were all dressed in fatigues and they were trying to get people to go to one of their events and i remember just bucking up the courage and saying oh hi i'm at college i'm doing a graphic course but i'm really into photography can i come to one of your events and they said yeah yeah that should be fine that should be fine so i then the following day i didn't tell my parents because I thought they're going to think of, you know, I've lost it. And then I went, I remember going with my mate Damon. He had a, he could drive a car. <clears throat> so in his mum's Mini Metro, we drove because I'm waiting here, mate. I'm not going in there. And I walked in 
and it was full of maybe 300 people all speaking in tongues and shouting about Jesus and collapsing with euphoria of Jesus and I thought oh my god what have I walked into here this is unbelievably good photographs yeah and that's what can and some somewhere along the line I realized that I shouldn't rush it I think at an early age I must have been yeah. at this point I must have been about 17 uh, interestingly one of the images I took on that day made the book still yeah. it's still an image that I whenever I do lectures or anything I show people that image and say remember what you take now you never know how good or bad it is Absolutely. it might be the picture of your it might be the defining <laughs> image of your career yeah Absolutely. and you didn't yeah. even I don't even remember you know I just remember responding do you know what I mean I didn't I didn't consciously think oh there's a photograph I just was so young and I think I'm sure you're the same Zach sometimes some of your best pictures you don't even remember taking them absolutely yeah they just appear they're, they're sort of like given to you and then you get back or years later or you look at the negative and quite often I found there's only ever one negative of it or one file of it or whatever it is does that make sense there's not yeah. very rarely do you get a winner and there's like a whole series of them there's usually just one that's sort of amongst other crap does that yeah. make sense you've got image absolutely, image image yeah. and then one absolute bell ringer and then a load of crap afterwards i think that's the case with a lot of my sort of favorite or most impactful images yeah they're out on their own they just sort of sitting there going hello and you've got when to you, sometimes find it you know yeah looking at, when you look back at contact sheets that you I always found it a very interesting process of looking at a contact sheet and working out where you usually hit a good picture and yeah within that 36 frames for example you, you could sort of mine was about the 13th frame where i would get if i was concentrating on something i'd get something mm. around the 12 13 frame just going back slightly what was the tom woodwork on the wall it was his looking for love stuff right okay was that a turning point where you started realizing there was bigger narratives within just within taking pictures where i'd like to, i'd like to say I, I i you know a spotty 17 year old kid in that corridor went oh i understand narrative i understand it no i just went it, it was it was more naive than that yeah i just went whoa look at these aren't these amazing does that, does that make yeah. sense i don't think yeah. i had any sort of any consciousness of it it was just yes. there it was just i don't think i even remembered the guy's name i just i just thought how has he got how has he done this how is i, I think i was transported into a world that i'd never seen you know a provincial boy from northampton transported into a nightclub in liverpool yeah and yep. shot in color and beautifully shot so you know really really kind of like intimate I think, um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to say that was the pivotal moment that I found my calling. But the truth is, I was 17. I didn't know what I was doing. I hadn't got a clue. I just went, wow, these are cool. But you didn't and know I what you were doing because it's easy to look in hindsight. But you didn't, you hadn't looked further outside and you were learning to take all that on board. And, and, and yeah. now you can look back at it and you have a much more, you have a bigger knowledge. You see knowledge the context. Of, yeah, you, you see, understand yeah. that, yeah. That and that's why that's why I think understanding contemporary practice always is really important in your progression and understanding yeah. who's doing what and who has done what. Was the Jesus Army obviously was Jesus Army the first thing you thought I can create a story here and it's going to take me on an adventure? Yeah, yeah. Well, again, again, naively, I just knew that when I went there, I felt something. I felt a connection with these people. I think there's an important, important thing. I'll, I'll come on to that. There's an important thing that I, I've only in the last couple of years realized why that is. Um, I grew up as a Quaker. So as a, as a kid, my grandfather and my father were Quakers. So my experience of religion was every Sunday walking into the meeting house, as we called it, and sitting in silence yeah and then the kids yep. would go in for the first 10 minutes in silence 
and then 10 minutes in usually the children would go out into another room and we'd do some sort of Quaker activity you know bomb, ban the bomb flags talking about you know how we can stop wars you know uh, oppression of other people that kind of thing yeah so my concept of religion was silence yeah yeah and then I walk into a um a sort of commune I hate to use the word cult but it's kind of cult like experience I suddenly thought oh my god this is a different religion to what I'm used to and I suddenly and visually you can imagine visually it, you know they're all in khakis as well they're all in sort of army fatigues um it, it and that drew me in I think I think wow I thought this is something else it's not what I'm used to so I, I was, I'm nosy. I was being nosy and inquisitive and yeah. sort of educating myself because it was so alien to me. Um, there is, there is a caveat to the Jew something, which we can maybe come on to another, another towards the end or something, but it's all gone sour, not with me <laughs> with them, but they've gone sour. It's now been completely closed down. There was um, lots of there's something on my website about it actually if you want to read about it i put a sort of a thing yeah. at the end saying what's it? it's all you know they've got all these community houses worth millions of pounds um because they you know they all lived in shared housing and there's been like a, 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 a there, there was there was abuse basically i didn't see any i never i never witnessed anything obviously um but channel four are in the process of making quite an in-depth long form documentary on it of which I'm involved in some ways because I've I've got from the period where it was happening I was there yeah. so I've got like this archive of images um, of of the group as it developed if I'm really honest now I look back there was I didn't I didn't see or, or feel anything but there were moments where I thought this is something weird going on here um, but that Again, that it's all it's all going to court, so I probably best not say anything. Not I'm not going to court, but it's going to court, so I probably should not say much about that. But uh, I, I've put a, I've put a kind of announcement on my website about what has happened. Uh, so yeah, so that so again, you have no idea. <laughs> yeah. You have no idea what you you know that it sort yeah. of perfectly makes me come back. The image that I took at the beginning. I say is like you know you never know when you're going to take your best picture, and yeah. you never know. Like if I'm really honest, when that book came out, no one, a lot of magazines and newspapers, like the Sunday Times magazine, were all set to do a big piece on it, and then they bottled it because they thought this is, this is. I remember the quote you said, "I love the work. I think it's a great piece. It's a bit of a hot potato. We can't run it." Yeah, because people, particularly in the UK, in a sort of secular society people are a little bit off put but off you know are adver adverse to religion i remember the guy you know Darry lewis who published it he, you know i remember him saying to me you know religion's a hard sell um and i think he's got i think he was right but now the project's become something else you know yeah it's become something that will at the time i had no idea it's become a sort of kind of I hate to use the word it's sort of evidence of some a time that we will never see again. I think the style of the project was a sign of the times as well. In, yeah, totally. In, in what was happening in the nineties with the independent magazine and, and mm -hmm. such like, and then you went to the Berlin. You were there for the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. and does that link in with your awards for the you won Ilford Young Photography? Yeah, there. that was that was what won me the young. Yeah, so nineteen ninety. By which point. I'd let I'd finished the design course, um, and I got all the night the, the paper Keith Price again, you know the picture editor. He said, "How do you fancy doing three days a week for us? But you're doing nights, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I'd start at three. I think I start at three, and I have to do all the sort of Cub Scout check presentations, yeah, everything that nobody in the day wants to do. Then I have to do the night football matches." And then I'd have to be on call through the night until nine o'clock the next morning. So fires, car crashes. Yeah. So I did that. 
Night is another technical thing as well, isn't it? Because you're thinking, yeah. what what flash kit did you have? Mets. Yeah, I had a Mets. I had a sixty and a forty-five. Still got the C- forty-five. CT version. Yeah. Oh, yeah. they were big, weren't they? Mm. How Heavy. many battery packs did you have? Yeah, I, a bag of them. A bag of and, they, <laughs> and those batteries never worked, did they? They were always rechargeable that never worked. There we were banned in my life. And the wires as well. All them yeah. wires. Yeah. And oh, people yeah. forget that I won't get into techie. <laughs> people forget we had to sort of you had oh. to work it out. You had to think, right, they're that far away. You know, it was all done in your head, wasn't it? It was sort of you did the calculation. I, I think if you've had the Met C T series you never forget anything yeah. about that period. Mm. So you how did you get the book published with Jimmy Lewis? How did that come about? Um I uh I was living up in Yorkshire. We've sort of jumped a bit, but I was living up in Yorkshire and somebody in Manchester saw me saw some of the prints and said you should show this to Dowie. So I did. And after I don't know, maybe six months of messing around with how it might work, we went and published it. So Bear in mind at this point, it was like I'd been doing it for probably 10 years. When I say doing it for 10 years, I had like I had periods where I didn't do it, you know. Yeah. I would just keep popping back and adding stuff to it. And if they contacted me and said, oh, we've got a wedding next week. Do you want to come to a wedding? I go, oh, yeah. Oh, we've got a funeral. Do you want to come to a funeral? Do you see what I mean? It was like, yeah. and then one of them went, oh, I'm having a baby. Can you come and photograph they're in hospital. Can you come and photograph our baby in hospital? Do you see what I mean? It was like, but that over a period of like 10 years, it all sort of, and then I, yeah, it, it, it was bitty. It was quite bitty towards the end. So the 90s was a massive learning curve for you. Mm-hmm. It, was a, it was your grinding and you say you accidentally did a book. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, I, I, it how did accident. you how did you approach Dewey? How did that? How did the book actually? How did you get that? Well, first book? I think I think the contact in Manchester, where I can't remember who it was, it was some sort of um, photography kind of group in Manchester. So I think I rang him or emailed him, probably one of the two, yeah, and said, "Oh hi," I think, I'm trying to think who it was. I can't remember the guy's name. Blah blah at Manchester Photography Group said I should show you this. Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, are you, how about next Thursday? Pop over, show me it. So I literally went to his house and showed him it. And then it sort of like went on from there, really. I think he saw that there was potential in it. Yeah. I think he could see that I'd put the hours in as such. The hardest thing, I think, was editing it. Because there was so much stuff. And a lot of it was samey, if that makes sense. There was, lots, there was, sense. There was lots of like people with the arms in the air, you know, collapsing and hardly any intimacy. And the intimacy was the hardest thing to get because it was, you know, trying to get in when they weren't having a big sing song was the hard bit. Isn't the art of a documentary photographer about creating something out of nothing? And when you're working on documentary projects, a lot of the circumstance, the scenery, the scenario is unfolding every other day is the same and you have to interpret it and find something within it and that's i think that's what makes a, a documentary photographer or where you develop a narrative for a story it doesn't just unfold you have to make it unfold as you're working in the same sort of surroundings and environment it's um it's a very good it's a very um difficult skill to master and so are you still there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm still here. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> add it, I'll add it that bit out. <laughs> no, don't worry. I was still, I was just listening. I, yeah, I just felt like I was talking too much. No, no, I want you to talk. I want you <laughs> yeah. to talk. Right, we'll go, we'll go again. So, the 90s obviously was your, your branding. What, what changed in the, in the Zeros? What changed at the beginning of the new century in, in the next sort of 10 years? How did you evolve as a photographer? I, I think so. I, I worked for the local paper um, and then after about two years um, I apply. I, I got a job up at a, a picture agency up in Yorkshire doing stuff for the Guardian and the Telegraph covering like Manchester, Leeds, 
we went as far as like sometimes went to Edinburgh and stuff. You know, we covered that whole kind of region at the top. Was that the Gazellian? Yeah, doing most. It was Gazellian. Uh, it was mostly broadsheet stuff, all sorts of stuff we did, um, but mostly broadsheet. Um, so I, I did that for probably about six or seven years, and then I got um, a sort of lucky break with the Saturday Magazine of the Times. So they started sending me, again, a kind of fluke, really. I think they got confused where I was based. I think they thought I was based. Uh, I think they, they rang up and said, oh, can you do this? Uh, it was something to do with a, a, some unusual school that were doing. Um, they did like meditation at the beginning of the lessons and stuff. It was like this sort of like, you know, new world, new, new, you know, new world school, not new world, new well-being that's it that's the word i'm looking yeah. for well-being school so i did all these pictures and i think it was someone like stafford something like that so then they started giving me all these jobs sort of near stafford oh john's near stafford there was no one didn't live anywhere near it yeah. um and then they sent me to america a few times and then i was sort of the go-to man for sort of reportage stories yeah um then i started working with this one journalist called uh, robert crampton so we sort of became this sort of team so if they ever had like a strange human interest story or you know that kind of this is like 2002 onwards yeah anything like slightly odd they'd send me and robert so we ended up having this sort of like i don't know probably about 10 years together eight eight or ten years of just literally going to the most bizarre things doing the most bizarre places do you um, think that do you think that came about because of the love, power, and sacrifice that you, as well as the, the daily editorial work that you had, a they, they saw you as somebody who could work in these sort of bizarre conditions because you'd already done it. If I, I think it's yeah. partly that, and partly I'd, I'd spent a lot of time, editorially trying to master shooting color transparency. Right. I, I set in my head, when I first started at gazellian that if it if they asked for something in color i wouldn't shoot it on color neg i would shoot it on color transparency so i basically whenever i could i was practicing how to get things right on color transparency and obviously the saturday magazines all liked the idea of color transparency because that was mm -hmm. what they did mm -hmm. so when they saw my portfolio uh, it was back in the days when you sent you remember you used to send like those big blackboards of dupes mm. you'd get your 35 mils dupe to 5.4 do you remember that yeah so they asked my portfolio so i sent in my sort of big black boards it's hard to explain on a podcast but they were big a3 boards with your portfolio as five by four trannies yeah but they were from yeah. 35 mil so i think they could see that i could shoot color and when i sent the jobs in they think i remember the picture editor saying you know how to shoot color, don't you? There'll be plenty of work for you. Um, does that make sense? So I think yeah. they just knew they could rely on me to get color trannies to them all the time in de you know decent quality. It was a very difficult format to master. Yeah, for the it was it was an it was an utter nightmare. But once you'd got your head around it, yeah, understanding that certain colors reflect. You know, color cast. To, color cast that, that was one issue then you had the other issue with you know for example if you're shooting something and it's got loads of white or yellow or something in it yeah whatever your meter says or whatever you think it says you've got to compensate even more yeah and all that push pulling when you go to the lab you know yeah. you can clean up your highlights you can yeah. you know you know i found you know using high speed high speed transparency was a waste of time you were better off pushing low speed a little bit if that makes yeah. sense it very much does yeah i think uh, just even using a different type of film wasn't didn't the fuji have like a sort of chunky green to it like mm. this was sort of underlining green yeah. and i remember you in the kodak had this i can't remember off the top of my head the put with like the warm tone and yeah and and it, it was a really massive part of my learning learning e6 and i remember being an assistant watching photographers the, the amount of gels they used to take and yeah magenta and cyan gels and stuff i just like remember that. having like a separate bag with a filtration system so you yeah. lock up somewhere you have to sort of filter for the light with color meters yeah. and all sorts 
yeah. I, did you feel when you were shooting transparency that you you had to sort of give in to some sort of colour cast on it and say, right, you've got your flash, obviously, which you can blue it out and get the nice daylight balance. But there was always something. I always said, well, I'm going to accept certain colour cast changes with, yeah, with that, I think and I'm you... going to go with that. Yeah. Rather than fighting to get a pure sort of finish. Um, and I think when you shoot an editorial as well, you're shooting quite low shutter speed sometimes yeah. and to get the ambience and that would sometimes bring in a yellow from the, the, the lights, the ambient lighting yeah. and stuff. So you had to sort of, I had to sort of say, well, I'm going to accept there will be some yellow in this. The, the flash will take away some of the horrible casts. And I think it was about accepting a way of working within transparency. Yeah. I do remember using a trifle a lot more. Oh, I remember yeah. I had like this little, I've still got it actually, like, like a little travel gitzo that I had. I remember using that all the time. Yeah. So instead of using flash sometimes, I'd just be on a tripod hoping for the best. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, sitting by the, <laughs> going to the E6 lab and just sitting there praying that something would come out. Oh, the night or occasionally run, or something yeah, like that. Or sometimes you'd run a roll and say, oh, please, just run this first. Yeah, run this test one through. Please yeah. put it through at plus a third. See what happens. Then you'd get yeah. it out and you'd go, oh, bollocks. I'm sorry, I shouldn't swear. Oh, damn, I've got it wrong. Put it through at plus one. See what happens. You, know what you, I mean? had, you had to have a good pen, didn't you? Because yeah. you, 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 I remember looking at a few E6s and going, I forgot what to write on the no, plus I one, used, zero. What, what, I, was, what to... I used to scratch it with my tooth. <laughs> one stop was one gash. Two stops was two gashes. Ah, you had a cord system. Yeah. Do you remember when the when when there was that transition between everybody sort of accepting colour neg? And if I remember early two thousands where people where we could start scanning neg, so we could yeah. leave transparency behind, and the, the the liberation and the freedom of shooting colour neg for me. I was... just I, I just found shooting thirty five mil colour neg never really that early colour neg. You know that sort of Fuji yeah. or Supra or whatever it was called. Yeah. I always just never got on with it. It always looked really horrible and orange and grainy and yuck dirty it was yeah. like and so that's why i kind of carried on shooting transfer i used to get told off sometimes why have you sent us e6 we can't process it you know i've had that so many i remember doing a telegraph job telegraph like you know features job and i sent them loads of 120 i shot it yeah. all on a hasselblad and they went absolutely bonkers at me why have you sent it oh, we can't process it you know it was times were changing times were changing <laughs> yeah. because yeah and I, I was still like sort of experimenting with medium format you know yeah no i i just <laughs> i just remember color neg i could I, I could shoot in the dark mm. and not worry about it anymore and for me it was really accessible and i didn't have to worry i could put my lights away i could put my flash down and i could use ambient light again and and, and you know it was just a wonderful feeling and and that transition, do you remember the transition from sort of when digital was being forced upon us and mm -hmm. we have it to sort of then, and budgets were changing and things Again, were I, try, I tried hard to, I held on as long as I could. I held on. I don't, I don't think I didn't want to. I just, I just, I don't know if you remember some of those early digital cameras. It, it just didn't yep. work. They were really hard to use. The focusing on them was really hard. Which and ones? I had like a, a Nikon D100 or something, was it? The early, you know, the first generation. I... It the first generation. It was the ones that when it, when it trans, when the transition happened. I think I had a D2 or something. I D2. refused to call Nikon when it changed. Yeah, no, in the end I sold all my Nikons and went the, Canon because they well, were, Nikons were rubbish. They were going, what, the third frame or quarter frame or something yeah, like they that? Were, yeah, they were, and... right. I refused and I was sold by the Kodak Pro and the Kodak Pro used, I could use my normal Nikon lenses for it Yeah. and it cost me £6,000 yeah. something, and it was the worst thing I've ever bought and I remember getting it and the processing, you take 
one two shots running you had to wait like three minutes before you could take the third one so as you can imagine it's ideal in a five minute shoot and i remember thinking i remember almost in tears thinking i've spent six thousand pound on this kit something like that it was that much at the time yeah yeah and i remember working till i paid it back and then i just threw it in the bin <laughs> and then i had to sort of suffice and, and start getting into the Nikon. I did wanted to stay with Nikon, but it was an interesting period. And I remember I, I used to shoot a lot of neg and pretend it. Oh, I remember shooting the job and pretending I was shooting digital, but I was shooting neg because I couldn't rely on my Kodak. <laughs> yeah, like... yeah. I remember the, the Times Magazine, literally, it was going that way. And I remember an email coming through and it sort of basically said, as of next week, we will no longer be accepting film. It literally, it didn't, no one was warned. It was just said, that's it, no more. So that yeah. week I had to go and buy, I went and bought myself a phase one back from a half of blood. It cost me eight and a half grand. Wow. I've still got it actually. And I, as much as people might, you know, might laugh, I think it's a fantastic, because it's a really old chip. Yeah. Okay, it's got its, it's got its limitations. You can't go above 200 ASA, maybe 400 ASA, ISO rather. Yeah, but there's something about it. I do quite a lot of, you know, artifact copying of it with it. it th there's something still really beautiful about it. It looks like a roll of film a lot of the time. Do you know what I mean? Cause it's got, it, it's, it's got a really neutral color balance. It's an old, it's a phase one. It's a, it, you know, it, it connects onto yeah. the back of my, my V Hasselblad. I still use it, you know, at least. You know, well, once yeah. or twice a month. I very, really, I very rarely use it on a proper job because it's a bit clunky and it's really, you know, I'm used to autofocus now for commercial work. Um, but yeah, anyway, camera well, tool. Well, everybody's into expired for them now. Why, you know, yeah. what's wrong with using expired old backs, you know, old yeah. digital backs? So at the time when you were doing, just the previous, going back a little bit again, is, is when you were doing the Jesus Army and, and stuff you, you you were getting commissions and you're shooting black and white and i presume that's how your nasa project came about yeah again the nasa project um the, the majority of the material i shot for that ring was in color transparency yeah but i had a sort of b camera rolling kind of for myself and so the pictures that are in the nasa book are basically the b-roll um and that sort of kind of comes back to what we were saying during lockdown, I went back over the negatives yeah. and I'm sure you'll, you'll kind of resonate with this. When you look at some work 20 years later, it's almost like it wasn't you photographing it. You have no memory whatsoever of taking it. Yeah, you remember, you remember being there, but you don't have that connection. Like, you know, if you went and photographed something t today and you edited it on Monday, you're connected to it. You remember what happened. You remember how the chain of events happened. Yeah. With yeah. the astronauts, I went back, I got all the negatives out, probably about 30 or 40 rolls of film. And I suddenly, suddenly started seeing pictures that I'd never printed. And I don't quite know why it's because I probably had that memory connection with them as in, Oh, that didn't quite work because that was doing, you know, this one's a better picture. So a lot of the stuff in the book was stuff that I, had never printed. So it suddenly dawned on me that this is a story about a group of men. It's about a kind of band of brothers. And it's also a kind of statement about trust. We're getting a bit deep here now, Zach. Yeah. The fact that they trusted me. I, I just, I find it hard to believe, I might be wrong, that that would ever happen again. That a, an English kid I was quite young. I was in my twenties. Yeah. Would rock up at NASA. NASA would say, hello, young man. Yeah. I was with, there is, there is a bit of a backstory to it. it Channel four were doing a film. They were doing, um, uh, a kind of old fashioned documentary where there was no script. They gave enough budget for them to go there for a year and film what happened. The moment the astronaut found out he was going to be an astronaut to the moment he went up into space. Yeah. I'm sure people now know that a lot of the documentaries you see on TV now, there's kind of the story is told. They're told what the story needs to be. Does that yeah. make sense? 
You're making a documentary about X. We need to see X, Y, and Z. This was in the years. This is the the back end of documentary filmmaking. So I was basically brought in as the stills guy, but because yeah. he was shooting in a sort of cinema verite way, I couldn't actually be there when he was filming. So I was always one ten minutes behind him, if you know what I mean. So he'd film yeah. a scene, and I'd sort of like mop up what he when he'd moved towards something else. So if yeah. he was filming an astronaut over there i was filming the astronaut he just so i had a very i had a like a, a unique opportunity mm. uh to be embedded in a group of men i just find it hard to believe that would still happen i don't i think of obviously nasa's a mega thing to be able to walk into and and but i think as a sign of the times i, yeah. I remember working i remember i was at college and my college in sunderland was opposite the Monkwee Mouth Colwing, and I was looking for an idea to go and photograph. And I thought, I'm not going to take pictures of coal miners. So I literally walked over the road, went to the manager's office, and literally knocked on his door and said, I'm a student over there, can I come take pictures of the coal mine? And he went, Yeah, right. when do you want to do it? So I think in the 90s, was a, in, in, in that period, the era was a different world, and you wouldn't be able to do it now. And yes, yeah. I doubt you'd be able to walk into NASA and um, and, and I think there was a it. trust, I think I think particularly in America as well. Yeah. And I'm sure you've had this. I just remember there was a, there, there was definitely a, a, if you rock, for example, when I was at the Chronicle Echo, the, the local paper in Northampton, yeah. if you rocked up a lot of places to photograph whatever, there was like, they were flattered that you turned up. Yeah. There was like an honour. Oh my goodness, the man from the Chronicle Echo is here. Yeah. yeah. And the same with NASA, there was like, oh, someone's interested someone someone you know a filmmaker or a photographer is interested in us yeah. there was a naivety if that almost makes sense there was no control over us there what there obviously was control over yeah. us but not in the way now it would all be managed do you see what i mean it would all be you know no social media or there'd be everyone would be doing you know you know it's stuff totally different on, world it would be a different completely different experience and not forgetting one important fact is they were naive to and i was naive you know i didn't really realize until now when i look back at it you know how i did it yes. how how did i win that one how on earth did i win it wasn't it wasn't through my my ability as being a schmoozer or anything <laughs> to see what i mean it was just like a series of events that happened i met someone on a job they were from yorkshire i was living in yorkshire they we got on well they said to me in passing, we're making a film. We might need a photographer. I get a phone call. Are you free next week to go to America to do this astronaut thing? We'll be away for six weeks. Are you in? We'll pay you very little. Yeah? I went, yeah, I'm in. Do <laughs> um, you see what I mean? It wasn't yeah, true. Absolutely. It was a series of, like, um, sort of happy coincidences, you know? Yeah, that's just pretty... It was a pretty mega thing. Even just getting six weeks commission would be is an yeah, amazing exactly. thing yeah so in your next party journey did the english journey then so was that the next stage in your storytelling yeah i think so the, the, the english journey was something that started um when i first moved to yorkshire so i don't know if any of you any of the listeners or you remember the photography museum in bradford there's a big photography and film museum and yeah. outside the photography museum is a big statue of a guy in a coat with a beard, who's the, you know, their famous son, J.B. Priestley, who was like this sort of left-wing writer from the 1930s. And he wrote a book called English Journey. And I remember buying a, uh, going to the local library, finding a copy of English Journey, reading it, and then a few weeks later, finding a first edition in a second-hand shop in Bradford. Mm -hmm. And I read this book and I just thought, oh my God, this book feels like it was written now. It's like so contemporary. He talks about, you know, the plight of the workers, the fact, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like reading. I, I implore everyone who, who gets a chance is read it yeah. because you'll be, you know, he predict, he talks of England as if it's now, but it was like in 1930. He's got a beautiful way of writing as well. So I, the seed was sown in Bradford oh. and then 10, 15 years later, I thought, the book, I found the book again. I don't know. I was looking for something. Found that book. I thought there's a project in that somehow. So I reread it. 
Then I applied for a grant, uh, an Arts Council grant, got enough money to actually do it. So, and then, uh, like I said earlier, I did it. And I decided to do it on 5-4. I decided not to do it like a reportage piece, more of a sort of, um, a more a slow version of what I normally do. Um, and the first time around was a bit of a disaster. Just, all, just the whole thing was a bit of a disaster. I think I, I, I'd gone there and bent, I, I was way too prescriptive. I'd read yeah. a section in the book and I'd go to that bit in the book, if that makes sense, and kind of photograph that particular thing. And I ended up with a series of pictures that looked really, really, almost like a local history project. Does that make sense? So then by the third time round, I realized the way to do it was to visualize, this sounds a bit odd, but it, it's not as odd as it sounds, was to visualize JB Priestley in my car with me. Yeah. And I would be showing him what's changed. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I'd find as many things as I could that were kind of in the, they would obviously be in the same vicinity of where he went. Yeah. Within, you know, couple of miles of where he went but i was showing him like you know jb listen look this is now what was once a mine is now a series of small businesses in prefabbed buildings like you know big boxes metal boxes you know where there was once a beautiful hotel it's now a call center do you know what i mean those you know the roads you went on they're motorways now and they're motorway services look look at these look at these places does that make sense so it was like it, it was my english journey and JB Priestley was my passenger. Whereas before, the first time I went, I was I was the passenger and JB Priestley was showing me. Does that make sense? But it took me one go round to realise that the relationship was wrong. It was the one way round. I was driving, not him. Does that, does that, does that yeah, sense? your visuals are very, there was a mix of your visuals. They're very layered. They're very um, abstract. They're very... Um, quiet in some places and mm. you once I think you you under, try to understand how you shot it it's almost like a abstract snippet of time you're yep. not trying to say too much you're just saying this is it this is what it is this is a person behind a desk this is a, a, a field with, with an agricultural field and this is a the route through a town you're very it's a very surreal approach i found in in a way and i'm trying it's, it's almost like a truck it's like a classic road journey it's a, it's a road trip yeah it's an english road trip i think it's a road trip it's very quiet but, though isn't it but it's yeah it, but quiet, it's quiet sort of it's surreal. it's not ever gonna be epic as in epic visuals because england isn't epic i don't think i don't i don't think you very rarely see those sort of you know the sort of images i i'm thinking you know when you see sort of images of like um the Rockies or Death Valley or those sort of places. They always look kind of quite epic in their yeah. visuals. Yeah. Where in my experience, unless you go to maybe Scotland or Dartmoor or something, the majority of England is usually quite flat. It's usually quite dull, as in light-wise. And it's usually quite flat, mm -hmm. as in visually flat, not, you know, not yeah, yeah. flat as yeah. in flat light. And I kind of really wanted to embrace that and not fight it. I started off by wanting it to look, you know, really epic. These are beautiful, epic images of England. Mm -hmm. Whereas I suddenly dawned on me that unless I'm doing something wrong, most of the time, England doesn't look epic. As in that traditional kind of uh, almost visual cliche of what a landscape mm. could look like, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. rolling skies, beautiful shafts of light, you know, a rock in the foreground, everything in focus. The majority of time, it's a sort of, it's like a housing estate, you know? Mm. Mundane. It's sort of, but it isn't mundane, because it is kind does that make, it, it, the mundane is the beauty, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But You've got me, yeah, yeah. I think... Sometimes when you when you talk about the tide of images you were sort of comparing them to, this when you look at images in, in them sort of narratives, you sort of often think of how did they get to there and where they're going. Whereas with your pictures in that, you weren't giving that, you were just saying, This is it. For me, yeah. You were going, This is it. Doesn't matter what doesn't matter with I'm following preacher journey, it doesn't matter, there's nothing after that. This is it. This is what it is, there's nothing else. This is this is 
what it is and it's uh, you know it is abstract life is abstract and i think that come across and when i started looking at it once i got that once i understood the abstractness of it that sort of this is the sort of point of time of where we are now with that particular place i sort of got the book yeah i think i, th I think <laughs> a lot of people I, I i don't know this but i get the impression because i feel it sometimes yeah. yeah you look at it and you're you're expecting it to be how can i describe this Oh, look at how, almost like showing off as a photographer. Yeah. yeah. Look at these amazing photographs, you know, beautiful, you know, beautifully um, decorative and um, some people point a bit yeah. happy with, sumptuous image, yeah? Where these yeah. aren't at all. Like you said, I rock up, I vaguely know where I'm going. And in some ways, the more flat and boring and mundane and cold it looks, that's kind of how it is. The majority yeah, of my yeah. experience of driving around England, and I've done a lot of driving around England. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't very, and it's almost like, are we looking for those beautiful images? Yeah. yeah? Or is, how can I, how can I describe this? Um, yeah. are, are we, are those the unusual pictures or are the mundane ones the usual? Because you very rarely see them. Yeah. You only ever see sort of like you know those shafts of light of you know beautiful dark moody skies etc etc is the fact that they these images aren't that they're equally as valid because that's not that's kind of the norm in my experience and it's very rare you see a photographer doing that yeah exactly. the photographer off and I, I, and i'm a sucker for it if i see a nice bit of light on something i think oh wow wow quick quick that's it that's it you know a shaft of light or some you know interesting mm. juxtaposition of something mm. whereas in some ways the, the more mundane pictures is more, a more true rep, uh, representation of how i saw how, how we normally see things yeah and that's quite unusual for a for a photographer to do that and it, i did have and i still have a lot of self-doubt and about whether or not I'm going down the right track with it. But a few people have got it. And that's what, to me, once a few people have got it and understand and kind of like it resonates with them, then I feel kind of less full of self doubt. <laughs> Time and place and really just featuring all your work though, doesn't it? With, with you've got on this day, I think mm -hmm. even Sleeping Rough, the stuff you did, where you photographed, uh, was it the empty places where people slept rough? That's right, yeah. yeah. And that's quite, again, that's, I found that very similar in a way to the English journey, in, in a way of that, that sort of, you're sort of trying to talk about time as it is there with your work. And, yeah. and I, I and sort of saw that. Photography a little... is all about time. It is. It, but it about... does feature in your work a lot. Yeah, I think it, I've got, a, I've got, I've got a big thing about time and about you history have. and I like I mean all I tend to watch film wise is historical pieces yeah. or things about the future or the past or you know I think for me that is kind of photography's unique thing yeah like I said like I said earlier the Jesus army it's only in later years that I realized that that at the time I didn't quite know what it was and mm. now 20 years later is something completely different and that's yeah. you know you don't realize that until you know who knows what what you shoot today in 10 years time what that might turn into and what that might record might have been you know yeah. and i think that's what's really quite fascinating about about photography and particularly documentary photography you're kind of freezing a period of history that you'll never see again yeah. And it takes on a new life, completely new life, when you look back at it with nostalgic eyes. You sort of talking about this. You you've done that in on this day. How did that yeah. come about? What's that about? Right. So uh, again, that's st I started. The, I'm still doing it. I'm going to I'm going to Dresden next next the week after next Dresden, where the British bombed. Um, they sort of destroyed Dresden. I'm reading quite a few i'm halfway i'm always finished a big thick massive book on all the sort of ins and outs of what happened 
Uh, so it stems from about five or six years ago, probably more than that actually, maybe seven years ago. I was on a beach in France with my one-year-old daughter eating ice creams and we heard this sort of rumbling. She was a bit older than that because she was, I remember her talking, she talked a little bit. We saw this rumbling of noise on the beach and I remember her saying, Daddy, what's that noise? What are those, what are those big trucks on the beach? And I saw these trucks come and then like they were army trucks, Second World War army trucks. And I thought, that's weird. So we wandered down and I started chatting to them and I said, oh guys, what are you up to? And they're, oh, it's the anniversary of D-Day. And we're here to, you know, we always come here every year on June the 6th. And I went back to the hotel and I sat there and I thought, oh my God, on this very piece of land, on this very day, how many years ago it would have been then, something monumental has happened here. I thought there's a, there's a project in that. So it sort of started off as me thinking this is a project. So then I approached a, a, a professor of modern history and together, mostly him to be fair, he came up with like a list of events that he thought, I, I, I limited it. So it was from 1900 to the present day. Yeah. Otherwise it would, and it was gonna be in Europe. I thought I could get, if it's the States, it's unmanageable. Um, yeah. So, for the next seven years, I probably do about five, maybe maybe ten a year, and I go to a place in Europe or the UK on the day that something monumentally monumental and uh, world changing, or, yeah. and I go to the very spot that it happened on the day that it happened, and then I locate archive material from the original time and combine the images together so um yeah i've done at the moment i've done about 30 or f maybe 38 39 take some I'm doing with to... traveling as well say again that will take some doing with all the yeah, traveling and yeah prep it, and yeah, fit yeah. You in with your schedules yeah. and stuff and um i'm hoping to do 52 so that's like a you know 52 weeks um this so and then but i've got i'm doing the, the thing is with it is you know i was for example i had it all planned to photograph the place where dolly the sheep was born in edinburgh which is next thursday but they've refused entry i think it's probably to do with genetics engineering or something yeah and they fobbed me off by saying um the farm's no longer there which I know is not actually true because it is. There's something still there, but they don't want me. I've tried. I tried last year, and they said no. So I basically tried again this year, thinking they might have forgotten. <laughs> but no, no luck. Uh, the interesting thing is, some places are really, really open to it. Like I, I found uh, the room where they discovered DNA, and a really lovely sort of um, lady at the Cambridge University said, "Oh, I think there's a professor somewhere who's retired." He might know. Here's his email. So I emailed this professor, yeah. and he comes back to me. He says, "Oh yes, I remember what room it was. Speak to you know Marjorie at this in this place, and say I sent you." So I you know contacted my said, professor, Professor Brian Griffin, or whatever his name is, not Brian Griffin. Uh, professor Griffin has said I should. Oh yes, love. Yes, I know about you. Come in any time you like. It's room seventeen on the left <laughs> corridor, and I walk in. And it's a store cupboard. Wow. And I just thought, genius, absolutely genius. The place where they discovered the helix of DNA wow. is now full of crap. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's still little bits of marking. If you look at the image, you can see markings on the wall where they must have done stuff on the wall. And there's like books and like, you know, bits of rubbish everywhere. And just, you know, but some places are really, really like, oh no, sorry can't come in uh, you know like concord or like the place where concord was built they weren't having any of it um like i said some places are like the dresden one again they were they were really helpful but unfortunately the place where the first pathfinder bombs were put is uh a playing a football ground yeah and i've contacted the football ground but it's actually being re um uh rebuilt 
but the nice woman at the football club said you can still get in some there are, there are still ways of getting in but i wouldn't be able to tell you where they are basically so i think i could still get in but it's like a building site I, I i read that as her saying i can't let you in but there are ways you can get in if you want to you know you're also using diptych um, artifact collects with your pictures as well mm -hmm. so you're, you're collecting relevant things like the um the, uh, the the cold not dull pictures for your sheffield mm -hmm. image of the field so what that's that's what's that doing with the images is that sort of validating i think again i think it might it might say what you're saying is connecting the sort of past and present isn't it it's almost like a, a metaphor for connecting it all up because I, I found when you show the images out of context again they're kind of not epic no. some of them like they're a store cupboard yeah but when you see the context of where that's what that store cupboard is about there's no there's no fancy photography or anything i felt like it needed something to draw you to connect it to make it yeah to give the viewer a bit more information yeah. otherwise it sort of doesn't mean very much um and you did this with the english journey as well yeah yeah how did you get that that was like a charity shop yeah that, that was it was mostly every place i went to i went hunting around charity shops um and like the 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 on this day stuff a lot of that is research and then i have to go through the whole rigmarole of getting permission to use it which is takes up a lot of time and actually costs money as well a lot of the time mm. sometimes not a huge amount you can usually if you explain to them what you're doing and you're saying to them i'm not gonna it's not going to be used out of context and it's not going to be used commercially you can usually get it for like a, little, a reduced rate but you have to do your due diligence because sometimes you find you've got to try and trace who owns it a lot of the time does that make sense because yeah so i've almost become like a picture researcher as well which i actually quite enjoy if i'm honest i find i find tracking down you know images and who owns them and stuff yeah. quite quite interesting I quite enjoy it has any of that style moved into the grass project well the grass if i'm honest with you the archive stuff is better than the actual photography at the moment <laughs> i'm looking at it at the moment i've printed off i've got a big metal uh thing on my wall and i've got sort of maybe 20 archive pictures that i've sort of found uh, and my letter from the queen yeah. saying that i can't photograph her grass um and the actual images I've got are a little bit, I don't know. It's, I, I've only just started it, so I'm, who knows where it might go. How have you balanced all of this with earning a living? Because I mean, this, this, I, I presume you, 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 with the few, the, with these projects, you, you sort of organise your time around some shoots where you're getting paid to shoot off up north, and you can sort of link in yeah. some of your yeah, work. Yeah. Um, but you, you predominantly. Uh, with the sort of editorial side you do a lot of portraits you do a lot of covers for from like the the, the times and yeah so i do i do a bit of that and i do quite a lot of work for charities and i do um a lot of stuff for design agencies like annual reports and stuff yeah because design like, plays uh, a big part of your work as well doesn't it like with your if, if i'm really with, honest um, if i really with that without that without that commercial yeah. work i wouldn't be able to do any of the other stuff obviously and I'd like to be in a position where I did. It's always it's always a really fine balance. Yeah. You know, sometimes you wish you had more commercial work coming in because you're a bit low on cash, and then sometimes, not as often as I'd like, you have way too much commercial work. And you think, oh, I really want to do something interesting. <laughs> I want to do something for myself, you know. So it's like that constant, you know, up and down. If I'm honest now, Jan it's January, isn't it? So I've been quite quiet. I've, I've hardly worked in January. So I'm a little bit keen to get a bit of commercial work in to sort of, you know, um, get the get the coffers up. Um, but yeah, it, I think all photographers have this, not all photographers. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of photographers out there that have this kind of constant battle with themselves. That fight between art and commerce, you know, have I, have I got enough money to be able to go and do some more grass pictures you know or do i need to get some more money in yeah. to, you know yeah it, it's interesting because your your portrait style editorially for 
the magazines very much differs from your editorial style in books. Yeah, I, th I, I think partly because editorial magazines want a particular type of picture. Yeah. Yeah, there's a certain, you know, I, I'm pretty sure if I went to, you know, a Times magazine or a, a Guardian magazine job and went a little bit kind of <laughs> shot it on my 5 4 of blankness. They'd go, uh, this is not what we wanted. We wanted a nice, you know, nicely lit, well crafted image. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're the only photographer I know who's had the cover of the Rolling Stone magazine. Now, that must have been really a big wow in your head when, you know. Uh, again, again, <laughs> completely, no idea. I had no idea. <laughs> Well, you did oh, the killers as well, didn't you? Yeah, you shot the killers oh, for the done. cover of Rolling Stone yeah. magazine. I mean, well, did you did not was... think, wow? No, I didn't. Because really? if I'm really honest, I'm I I, I didn't. I, I've heard of the killers, right? Not my cup of tea, to be honest. I don't really, not really a big fan of the killers, and it wasn't a particularly pleasant experience. I won't say any more. Yeah, that's fine. But but photographing the killers wasn't a career highlight if i'm honest it was a little bit stressful it was all they were doing a sort of like photo junket at hoban studios so they'd hired every studio out and um we were last on the list so by the time the killers had got to the studio seven yeah had you already but, been commissioned by rolling stone no it was actually shot for someone else and Rolling Stone bought it off me. Right. So it was originally shot for the Times magazine. Yeah. And then the Times used a really small image. They didn't even run it very big. They ran just a shot of Brandon, is it? Is it Brandon? The, the singer, lead singer. Like an interview with, you know, do you know when they used to sort of ask people questions? Do you know when they ask, you know, 10 questions about your life? Yeah. Yeah. And then Rolling Stone came on to me and said, oh, can we see the set? So I sent them the set and they used it on the cover, which is... But yeah, so when they arrived to Studio 7, I'd been waiting there. I think they came at 4 o'clock. I was told my slot was 10 o'clock. Yeah. I think they put it in sort of order of, order of kind of importance. Yeah. yeah. I think GQ went first and then it went down the hierarchy. And then... The Times Magazine got it last, and they they were not into it. They were not into it. <laughs> it was awful. So again, I, I it was a fluke. I think I think I think I'm going to say something quite controversial here. I, I I think a lot of there's always this talk about um a portrait photographer and this notion that it's this um collaboration between the viewer and the photographer and I and I yeah. extract their personality out of it I just don't buy that at all yeah. my experience is it's usually right you've got five minutes yeah they don't really want to be here they'll give you what they want yeah they'll give you a look and you've got to do your damn bestest to get that look and as much as you can get out of it before they yeah. go have you got enough have you got enough can, can we are you almost finished are you almost finished that doesn't always happen to be fair some people usually give you, you know, you always feel a bit embarrassed that you've, you know, you've kept them for too long. Yeah. Yeah. But you think you've obviously got better things to do than sat here with me. But my experience a lot of the time with particularly sort of high end celebrities is it's five, it's literally five to seven minutes. David Hockney was uh, five minutes, 45 seconds. Right. From start to finish. And you know, anyway, that that's just my thought. I, I, I've I'm seen sure... it. I've witnessed it. I've experienced it. I've seen it. You normally, know, yeah. normally it's I've, it, I've, it's happened to me in the corporate world. Although I have had a few odd celeb types who are a bit horrible, but um, yeah. normally in their big CEO side, where big corporations, where I've seen yeah. it. I've actually seen. I assisted Peter Marlowe once, where he was taking, we'd set up two different shots for American Scientific Magazine for the head yeah, yeah. of the Guardian Royal. And we'd set up a full, a, a, a black and white shot and a tranny shot. And he'd literally, Peter just took one frame, one frame. And he went, he got up and walked out. Yeah, yeah. He said, that's all you need. 
that was it. So yeah, I've, I've seen it. Um, I haven't done as much as you of like that one-to-one set up in the studio at all. It's not been my sort of venture in, in it. So were you a photojournalist in the nineties then? I don't know what I was in the nineties. I was just, I was just, um, I was still doing my little personal projects and I did get quite a lot of a report. I, yeah. It's all words, isn't it? I got a lot of reportage work off, you know, either the Saturday or the Sunday times magazine. I was sort of like, that was what I was known of. And I, and I think in the, in the nineties, early two thousands, uh, it was all about sort of almost being a specialist, wasn't it? It was like, Oh, yeah. you know, John's good at, John's good at doing reportage stuff. Well, let's use John. Cause he, you know, we know we're going to get something yeah. usable. And then I suddenly that sort of started going a little bit out of fashion in sort of early two thousands. It started going a little bit lower. Well, we know. And then I started thinking I've got to, to get money. I need to be able to do portraiture. So I started doing a bit more offering up, you know, I can do a portrait, you know, I can do portraits. And then I suddenly started doing more portraiture. And like now, rep, if I'm really honest, reportage is very rare that you get a reportage job. Mm. It's mostly portrait, isn't it? I'm sure you're the same. It's like, it's. I think it's partly to do with budgets and partly to do with fashion. Like, you know, somebody once said to me, you know, you know, on Sunday morning, you don't want to open the magazine and see pictures of like, you know, people down on their luck next to your adverts for your posh toaster mm. do you know what i mean you want to see aspirational lifestyle you want to see you know how the how the beautiful people live you know and i think so to to, to be you know to continue to be commercially viable i kind of had to start t- taking portraits if i'm honest i'm not particularly comfortable being a portrait photographer I don't find it comes easy to me. I don't think many photographers str- do. I, I, I struggle. I find that one-to-one scenario kind of quite daunting. Whereas if you put me in a situation where I can hang out and sort of, you know, spend time and just relax and just let it flow, I feel much more comfortable. And, and I feel much more motivated. As in, I come home thinking, wow, that's so exciting. I really enjoyed that. Do you think a lot of that comes because it's on other people's terms? I think if you're doing a, a sort of editorial report for yourself, it's a little bit more open. I right? think that's true. And I think I'm naturally, I'm a natural introvert. Yeah. I'm naturally not particularly good at sort of like... You're not in control either. Yeah, and I, I'm not particularly good at sort of small talk. Yeah. I've never, you know, I... And I think being a photographer, you know, particularly being from a young doing it from such a young age i think it's made you made if you were initially a, an introvert it probably makes you more of an introvert when you're not working because your experience with people is usually when you have to photograph them so when you're not photographing them you kind of you haven't learned how to sort of yeah. do small talk. does that make sense it does so who are you now then what are you now where is where do you see i know you you're mentoring and you're you're doing part-time lecturing at universities and and you've got the new mentoring scheme on your website yeah. who are you now is it you know we've seen we've seen your evolution is that the word we've seen your yeah. how you've evolved i think i'm the same i'm the same i'm exactly the same i think i'm probably uh i'm a little bit more comfortable in myself I kind of, you know, I, a bit more, a little bit more confident. The self doubt still appears, but not as often. Um, I think that's because I've sort of learned to sort of take my time and not, not release anything until I'm completely sure that I'm happy with it. Um, I think I'm a lot calmer. I'm not as arrogant. I like to think I'm not arrogant, hopefully not. Um, I'm just a, generally a more kind of, um, not thoughtful, a more kind of solid, solid human from just experience and, you know, growing older. You just know when, you know, 
but I still think at the core I'm still the same you know hopefully people who've met me or people who've been photographed me have come away thinking you know it was a fair transaction you know it was the guy was you know John hasn't taken from me he's he's been quite open it's been a two-way transaction if that makes sense which um which two photographers have been the biggest influence in your life whether Mm. personally or just with their work good question uh, with their work, it has to be uh, a photographer called Mishka Henna, who's based up in Manchester. Uh, he sort of came from the same sort of direction as me initially, and then kind of went off at a junction, turned right, and started doing some, has been doing some really fascinating work with uh, reappropriating images and using Google Earth. And I don't think he even uses a camera anymore. It's it's all about the use of imagery in society and how he's he sort of plays with the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and photographer wise, I know it's really old fashioned, and Bill Brandt still gets me every time I look at it. Yeah. I know it, I, there's just something about everything I hear or read or see by him. I know it's quite dated now, but. For the 1930s and you look at his work and you think he was he invented the cliche you know that sort of that sort of black and white reportage documentary image i know some of his were like you know he posed some of it and it was you know but there's something about them that you think that is where it all started and i think it reverses back to where we our conversation started where i found that book at the school library and that was the moment I realised that there was more to this. this. These feelings of taking pictures that I found really fascinating, people were doing it like for real, you know. And there's a book in the school library, you know. Yeah. So I kind of like tip my hat to him and think, thank you, Bill. You, you know, you you started me off. It's almost like my grand, you know, almost like I was looking as a sort of grandfather figure. Not that I've ever met him or, you know. Or know very much about him on a personal level. There's something about him that I sort of look as a, a sort of a great grandfather figure that I sort of think it was yeah. you who started me on this journey, and I thank you for that. Wasn't there a connection between Brandt and Priestley in the in the Bolton? Yeah, there was. Yeah, because uh, Brandt did a lot of his stuff in the north, didn't he, of the miners and stuff at the same time as as Priestley was writing yeah. his book, and I think there was some. There might have been some article somewhere where Brandt did the pictures and Priestley, because Priestley yeah. did quite a lot of journalism. He wrote a lot he of did, journalism. Yeah. But there was a whole group of them, wasn't there? Mm. There was Spender, and I'm sure Brandt was in there. And I, off the top of my head, I can't remember the other guys. Yeah, there is another guy as well. Yeah, I have and covered it on Ge- the channel. I covered it. On yeah, the George Orwell was around at the same time, wasn't he? They were all yeah. kind of. Yeah. It was a sort of an amazing period for for journalism mm. and. It was almost it was like the birth as documentary as we know it. Oh, absolutely, I and, and, and that the Spender book is just beautiful. I, I, I'm fascinated with that book and mm. that whole period. And, and I think, uh, I think there's still a place for it. Oh, but well, I think, well, well, I, but I think, and I, but I think it needs to, it needs to develop and sort of become, sort of, it needs to be modernised. Yeah, and, and, and I'd I, like to think that I'm still doing. We're all still doing it with our own as david hockney says we're all adding our own glitter to it you know it's still the fundamental the idea is still the same that you don't need to fabricate stuff you don't need to change very much maybe the way you deliver it and the way you disseminate it you can change but the the core message and the core concept is you don't need to change anything it's already there yeah absolutely i think with the english journey that resonated with me because of priestly and because I was fascinated with the the, the Bolton Blackpool's northern images of the time yeah. and, and the association, so for me when I was looking at that, I sort of got your story idea straight away. Mm-hmm. And just interesting, you know, you talk about time and and, and stuff. How do you think in seventy eighty years people will look back at your work in terms of your interpretations of time? And how do you think we will be looked at? And 
That's a good question. I I'd be horrified horrified to think how if any of it any of it still exists. Because it's all passed on, isn't it? There'll be a massive internet fire and the whole lot would be destroyed. You know. <laughs> one big internet landfill. Yes, but everything. yes, but I, I you know, would the I think things go you know, they they, they go around in circles and you can see how the resurgence of prints come back with digital yeah, uh, printing think, and stuff. So, yes, we we will be caught up in a digital landscape, but there are always ways that things come full circle and people are interested in history, you know, and, and I'd be interested to see what's picked up in yeah. 90 years and it'd be interesting to see how Priestley's interpreted then. Because I bet yeah. this is a photographer in 100 years maybe doing your journey again. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? So, what for photography book would you take you with you on a desert island? What's that book you go to? What's your, when you need some inspiration? What is that one book? Uh, I think a book that I've had probably for ten or fifteen years is he's not even a photographer. He's uh, he's a, I think he's a sort of performance artist, and he's called. Let me see if I can pronounce. I can never pronounce this correctly. He's called. Mm. Tai Ching Shui, which is Tai Ching, uh, T E H C H I N G, and his surname is H S I E H. He's Korean, and the book is is hard to explain. Each piece that he does is extreme time play. Mm. Okay, so for example, the opening piece he did, he he got a lawyer to sign um, an affidavit that what he was doing was true and honest, yeah? He locked himself in a room uh, with only one friend who had a key and he photographed a clocking in, clocking out mm. uh, on a 16 mil camera. So he had a 16 mil camera right. in the room and each day he took one frame and the first 20 pages are him one day photographed and you see his hair growing and his beard growing it's, it's basically one it's called a one it's called the one year performance between 1981 and 1982 you sent some links for that yeah and some of the uh, other stuff you the other people you've mentioned yeah. I'll put, I'll and try he also put the did links. An, he did another one where him and his artist friend tied themselves together for a year yeah and wow. i just think that kind of like total commitment and um time playing with time yeah uh, and understanding time and like playing you know this book is I, I would imagine it's out of print now but um it was an exhibition that i saw in manchester years and you know when i was living up there and it's a book that i always go back to i've just found something inside it oh, there's a print in there. um yeah so this is a book yeah i would say it was my favorite yeah Purely because there's so much going on. Every time you look at it, you find something else that he's done in it. It's quite big. It's a big, thick, yeah. it's like huge. Well, speaking of time, yeah, I've had a lovely time. time to, <laughs> yeah, it's tea time. I've had a lovely time listening to you, John, and yeah. um, it's just been great having you. It's my very first podcast, and I'll, always a pleasure. Well, I, a pleasure. I, I listen back and um, listen to all my mistakes and and go for the you know keep trying keep trying to improving and well it was fascinating and i hope people can learn something about you just about you know being a photographer you're not that much different to each other you know it's all it's all swings yeah. and roundabouts it's all life learning and you learn off each other and and it's better off with a few beers sometimes and yeah so thank you and it's been right, a real yeah. pleasure no with it. and um i'll what i'll do is i'll catch up with you at some point when you're doing or oh, really into the grass project mm -hmm. and see how you're developing and we'll jump back in on it at some point and get an update on you and um take it from there lovely have a nice one mate have a great day and i'll, yeah. I'll catch up with you soon john take care Zach. all the best mate see you take soon. care bye -bye. Bye, bye bye that's john angerson and uh, a great interview a really good talking to him this is what the camera podcast for talks about I'll put some links for John's website. Anyway, thank you. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe. Please share. Until next time, take care. Be safe. Goodbye. We are floored. We are bound down. See ya.
us, careless corpses, steal the dawn. We are storm.